Hello and welcome to the Town Hall. Today is but one installment in a series entitled Century of Story and Song. The Town Hall was founded in 1921 by a group of suffragists who wanted the space to be a home to adult education, consciousness raising, and civil discussion. Over the course of the next 99 years, many people, many artists, came to the hall and made the hall's acoustics world renowned. Isaac Stern, Nina Simone, Bob Dylan, and many more made important debuts that changed the course of music history. Today, we complete our four-part series on the little-known history of the town hall and comedy. Com comedians came to the town hall, including Mike Nichols and Elaine May, the subject of tonight's program. I'm so happy to have with me uh, Mark Harris, who is the author of Pictures at a Revolution, Five Movies and the Birth of the New Hollywood, which was a New York Times notable book of the year, and Five Came Back, A Story of Hollywood and the Second World War. He is currently a writer for New York, where he often covers the intersection of culture and politics. And most relevant to today, he is the author of this incredible book, Mike Nichols, A Biography. Mike Nichols, A Life, excuse me. Thank you, Mark, for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Yeah, I mean, I just want to dive into you for a little bit and your relationship to this uh, subject matter. But you've written a lot about movies. Can you just talk a little bit about like your earliest experiences? Like what led you to not only love movies, but want to study and write about them? <laughs> wow, I guess I would have to go way back as to why I loved movies, which I always did. I mean, I grew up in New York City, and so um, the first movies I saw uh, were, you know, other than children's movies, were probably on TV, like really bad old prints filled with commercials, sometimes cut into two parts when they showed in the afternoon. So I saw movies under the worst possible circumstances and, and still... Uh, really loved them, and I guess um, by the time I was in college, was really excited about the possibility of um, writing about them and, and and writing about movies and TV and culture, uh, sometimes with a, a political or sociological um, or gender uh, orientation bent to it is is what I've pretty much uh, done ever since. Well, I'm glad you have. <laughs> But my question, my next question is, okay, so Mike Nichols, why Mike Nichols? And what were your first memories of coming into contact with his work? Well, my, probably the first time I uh, came into contact with his work was before I even really understood what a director did, which is the movie, um, The Day of the Dolphin. <laughs> which is not by any uh, by anybody's estimation one of Mike Nichols's greatest movies but for people my age uh, it was the first um, it was the first Mike Nichols movie that would have been remotely suitable for kids which I was when I saw it I mean the movies Mike had made before then the graduate uh, carnal knowledge who's afraid of Virginia Woolf catch 22 were not movies that anybody would have been uh, allowed to see if they were a little kid unless their parents were very lax which mine were not um, <laughs> But, but The Day of the Dolphin, you know, it was about animals. Uh, it, it, it looked like uh, something that was okay for kids to see. So uh, that was probably my first actual uh, Mike Nichols movie. And the first one where, when I sort of understood what uh, movies were about and began to get interested in how they were made was The Graduate, which I saw um, probably when I was about 17. Okay. Well, I think The Graduate is for many people, their first um, encounter with his work. But we're here to talk about, you know, the the stage show, the live work that he did, um, and also the recordings that he did with Elaine May. Um, when did you first hear their records? Oh, very late. I mean, I think like a lot of people, uh, I, I got to know and appreciate Mike Nichols as a filmmaker before I was even aware that he had had this separate 
what I thought was a completely separate career before he embarked on this career as a director. I mean, the first thing I knew about um, Mike Nichols was that he was the director of The Graduate and also, you know, movies like Working Girl and and um, Silkwood. Uh, and the second thing I knew about him was that he was a really highly esteemed stage director in New York, that he directed The Real Thing on Broadway. And he was the person who, um, you know, brought Whoopi Goldberg from really small venues into uh, the mainstream. Um, and he directed Tom Stoppard plays. Uh, his whole partnership with Elaine May, that was kind of news to me. And honestly, even when I went into research for this book, I had always thought of their work together as a kind of interesting prelude to his directing career, but but a prelude that had nothing to do with it. And mm -hmm. what I what I discovered um, in the course of my research for myself was that their partnership actually profoundly affected uh, his decision to become a director and what kind of director he was and how he worked with women and how he worked with actors that it's really not possible to understand the career of Mike Nichols without understanding that first chapter of it. Well, I'd like to turn to Elaine May, who I think a general U.S. public is not nearly as familiar with as they are with Mike Nichols, um, but who is absolutely fascinating. And, um, you know, I, I wonder if you could just walk us through a little bit of her early life, especially in the Yiddish theater. Sure. I mean, uh, Elaine May uh, and Mike were about the same age. I think she was born in 1932. They met at the University of Chicago. And by then she had already had, you know, quite a life. She'd been married. Her marriage had ended. She had had a baby daughter. Um, and her parents worked in the Yiddish theater. So she had been, she wasn't a sort of full on child actress, but she had been on stage you know, since she was a toddler in their shows. So um, uh, she was kind of a showbiz kid, but a showbiz kid in a really sub specific kind of subsection of show business. Um, and Mike, by contrast, was not at all that. He, he was, um, you know, his background was completely different. But, but when they met uh, at the University of Chicago, when they were both uh, about, you know, 20 years old, um, they really quickly um, developed this affinity and also developed this partnership. Well, not to go into a lot of personal territory, but, you know, they may have had different backgrounds in terms of what their parents did, but they also suffered incredible losses earlier on in life, of course, like the death of parents, but also... Um, in the particular case of Mike Nichols, like Mike Nichols is an immigrant who came to this country because of great global tragedy. Right, right. I mean, Mike uh, spent the first seven years of his life in Berlin. He was born in Germany. His father was a Russian Jew. His mother was a German Jew. And like so many, I mean, his story begins the way so many New York stories do, which is he got out of Europe just in time in 1939 as Hitler was was rising and as Hitler's ambitions were rising. Um, he and his little brother came over on a boat to meet his father who had come over sometime earlier to set up a medical practice. And then a little while after that, about a year after that, uh, their mother came and the family sort of installed itself on the Upper West Side on West 71st Street um, and uh, had a really nice, uh, modest middle class life. You know, they, they, the four of them had uh, a two room apartment in uh, a small like a one bedroom apartment in a small building. Um, and uh, it was on the fifth or sixth floor. And in the lobby, Mike's father had a medical practice. So uh, they, they lived a relatively comfortable existence until um, Mike's father died very suddenly when Mike was about uh, 13 or 14 years old. It does seem like there is, and I think we can talk about this later in terms of their uh, comedy being what others would call snobbish, you know, or just sort of like a little effete, but uh, they have very different backgrounds, 
also in terms of class, you know, one being, you know, traveling all the time with this troupe and then Mike Nichols, you know, being on the Upper East Side, Upper West Side, excuse me, and going to sort of like one of the best schools in New York City. They came into U Chicago with completely different backgrounds. Right. Well, I want to I want to um, just push back a little on two of those details, though, um, because Mike's at the time that um, Mike got to the University of Chicago, like his his upbringing had been by no means posh. I mean, they mm -hmm. were on the Upper West Side because, you know, there were whole avenues on the Upper East Side that would not rent to uh, Jews. The, and the Upper West Side was not the sort of upper middle class uh, bourgeois neighborhood that it is now. It was, it was much more uh, an ethnically mixed middle class neighborhood of Jews, uh, blacks, um, Puerto Ricans, that was, those were the primary, you know, groups and, and Dominicans. Um, and uh, after Mike's father died, the family really did slide into poverty. Uh, his mother had a hard time um, uh, making ends meet. So, so Mike did not sort of breeze into the University of Chicago, I, I wanna say as like a rich kid. Um, I, I think it's important to know that because he was, you know, uh, at the time that he met Elaine May and got involved in theater, he was still sort of scrounging meals from the cafeteria, eating off uh, uh, plates that people had left behind. Um, it, it wasn't it wasn't really a, a comfortable um, existence that he came from. And that connects to the idea of, you know, there were people who... Um, who thought that uh, Mike and Elaine's comedy was snobbish. I would say it wasn't really snobbish. I mean, for one thing, they made such ruthless fun of snobs in their comedy, but um, it was very literate. Like it, it, it was very, very referential comedy. You know, it, it, it kind of assumed that its audience had read the same stuff and understood the same jokes and found the same things funny that the two of them did. And, and that was kind of, I, I think for people who felt locked out of their humor because they didn't understand the references, that could feel snobbish. But I think at heart, um, it wasn't because so much of what they found funny was like puncturing the vanity and pretension of other people. Thank you for that correction and that pushback in terms of uh, Mike Nichols' upbringing. Um, I wouldn't say it's a correction. I'd say it's just a no, different no, it's a, no, but it you know context really helps. Um, so they get to University of Chicago. Uh, I mean, they're both brilliant people, and as you say, they're both highly literate, but. Mike Nichols comes in and what is he studying? <laughs> He's studying medicine. He, <laughs> um, he, he, you know, I think like a lot of people still who go to college, what, you, you walk in when you're 17 or 18 thinking maybe you're going to do what one of your parents did and you walk out completely in a different direction. And, mm -hmm. and uh, that was um, absolutely what happened to Mike Nichols. I mean, for one thing, he slept all day. Uh, he was so freaked out and kind of overstimulated that he slept all day and kind of, ended up flunking out of pre-med. And for another, he just, uh, and there's nothing really in his background prior to that that suggests this was gonna happen, but he just got deeply excited by theater. I mean, and, and actually by performing, which is so surprising because Mike was, as a kid, very self-conscious about his looks. He had had a bad reaction to a vaccine when he was a kid that resulted in all of his hair being lost. He, um, and his, he was unable to grow hair. He wore a toupee and wasn't even allowed to wear a toupee until he was 14 after his father died. So you would think that this kid who, you know, really thought, I hope other people aren't staring at me, would not want to um, enter a field where um, uh, people were constantly looking at you. But, but Mike often had... Um, a pattern of, of going towards something scary and sometimes without even knowing why. And I think, um, I think this was one of the early examples of it. Well, well, how did they meet? They were at the same school, but what brought them together? <laughs> it's, um, you know, we'll, we'll never know 
really how they met is the true answer to that because Mike told so many different versions of the story. But they, they um, you know, the first thing that happened was that uh, uh, Mike was in a play, a production of um, Miss Julie, uh, that that had gotten some local uh, positive critical attention. It was a, an undergraduate production and ended up running for several weekends. And Elaine came to see it. And and uh, Mike tells the story of of him being on stage, knowing that the production was terrible, seeing her in the front row, kind of glowering at him. This he 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 called her this evil girl who just seemed to be signaling to him that she knew the production was terrible. And he tried to signal back to her that that um, he knew it too. And then sometime later, it's not quite clear uh, how much time, but they, he saw her in a train station, um, in, in an L station in Chicago, uh, when he was coming back from a movie. She was sitting by herself and he went up to her and started basically doing a bit. He pretended to be a secret agent uh, meeting someone for a rendezvous. And as he describes it, without missing a beat, she just picked up on what he was doing and responded in character. And they had this whole conversation, what we would now call improv, in character. Uh, and and I think for Mike, that was sort of love at first sight. It, th there are many times in his career, you know, meeting Buck Henry was another, where if you walked up to someone and they got your sense of humor and they could roll with you, you were going to be friends with Mike for life, but but I think nobody uh, of of no one was that more true than of Elaine May. And you know, they're at university, but more importantly to me, at least, they're in Chicago. And Chicago just seems, whenever I talk to people about comedy, I feel like so many roads lead back to Chicago, even if it's not sort of the second city line. Can you talk about what's happening in Chicago at this time in terms of theater and comedy in particular? Yeah, that is such a great point. I'm so glad you brought that up because um, Chicago was was this, this theater scene that was just kind of about to hatch when Mike got there and his his time there, his few years there was kind of coincident with it Hatching. I mean, it's one of those things where now everybody talks about Chicago theater and the Second City and the Compass Players, which is what Mike was a part of. Um, and and he kind of got to Chicago at this magical moment when a lot of theater was kind of sprouting up in every um, in every bar and club and vacant space that people could could rent and hang up a couple of lights in. Um, and so there was all this excitement around it, but but it hadn't yet really entrenched itself as a theater scene. But there was this particular thing uh, that Mike got involved with, which turned out to be incredibly important and meaningful in Chicago, which was he, he started working with um, this guy, Paul Sills, whose mother was a famous um, uh, acting teacher uh, named Viola Spolin. And Paul Sills, uh, and this guy, David Shepard, really pioneered uh, this, this early form of improv comedy. And, and the interesting thing to me was they didn't initially think of it as primarily comedy. Like, Mike and Elaine were really interested in comedy, but this improv theater, uh, a lot of them thought its purpose was primarily political, that... that that the idea of improv was you would jump right off the news of the day or um, whatever was in the headlines. And instead of writing something down and having it go through a long development process, you would just do something instantly riffing off news to sort of speed the revolution along. And, um, you know, one of the criticisms that Mike and Elaine got from the very earnest uh, people uh, in, their, in their troupe was sort of that, they were insufficiently, you know, down with the revolution. That that um, you know, one of them said David Shepard wanted to change the world, and and um, uh, Mike wanted to do uh, a scene about how hard it was to get airline tickets. So th there was a little bit of a clash, but of course, the the comedy that Mike and Elaine did, even in that that very early incarnation in Chicago and the Compass Players, quickly became like the thing that people most wanted to see and the thing that they kept coming back to see. 
Well, there's Chicago in the 50s and all of this that's brewing. And there's also New York post-war, which is so heavily um, influenced by Stanislavski and Russian theater in particular. And But there's a relationship between those, or is it just really um, Mike who's straddling? No, I don't think it was just Mike at all. I think... I think you're right. I think there is a relationship between those. And, and I mean, I think the way you can best describe it is that at one point when Mike was, you know, established as part of the Compass Players in Chicago and it was up and running, he and a friend said, you know, I don't know why we're doing this. We really don't know how to act. And so their first instinct was we have to go to New York. So I think, I think like that in a way that's that's the distinction between um, New York and Chicago. Already there was this little bit of a rivalry because um, you know Chicago did not want to be seen, understandably, as anybody's second choice. And and um, but but the idea was you know that New York would credential you and give you credibility. So there's a year in the um, middle 1950s when Mike goes to New York and studies with uh, Lee Strasberg. He, he doesn't um, he doesn't become part of the actor's studio, but he, he goes to Strasberg's separate classes that he teaches on the side, which is full of, you know, unbelievably promising actors. Paul Newman had been there. Gene Hackman had been there. Um, and then there's this tension about whether he's going to go back to Chicago, partly because um, for Mike, it felt at that time like going to Chicago would be an admission that he couldn't make it in New York. And there was tension on the Chicago end because the people who were running the Compass Theater sort of felt in part like, why do we need to bring in... Um, actors from New York that just makes us look like we don't have good actors right here. So mm -hmm. there was always that push and pull. Um, and, and Mike was, you know, right in the middle of it. Well, you know, that, that push and pull say between New York um, acting style and then the sort of incredible new burst of energy and technique that's coming out of uh, the compass group in particular, but Chicago generally, what would you say um, are the differences in technique that these performers are, you know, really being taught in these places? And more specifically, what are they developing in Chicago? Because, you know, we talk or you talk, everybody talks about uh, Elaine May and Mike Nichols really developing their act in Chicago. Like, what does that development actually look like on the ground day to day? Okay. Um, that is uh, probably like a book could be written about that, that it's, that's such an interesting, such a multifaceted question. And, and I'm going to hugely oversimplify it, but, but, you know, in the, 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 the super simple answer is that in the, in the mid fifties, um, there, there was this uh, school of acting called the method, um, which relied on sort of psychological understanding and certain, uh, techniques and certain memory techniques to basically be designed to elicit the truest possible um, performance uh, in, in any situation. And and probably like the, the actor most associated with the method in, in that period is Brando. And everybody wanted to be Brando. Um, the, the, the method was not only a New York thing, but it was a very New York thing. And, and uh, it was what Strasbourg was teaching and it was what the actors who Nichols was most excited about were, were using on stage. Um, Chicago, although the method was certainly like well known there and used by some people, Chicago had this separate thing going on which was more um, freewheeling, more seat of the pants, more about improvisation, which had not really deeply made its way to New York, but was already becoming a very, very big thing in in Chicago. And the 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 funny thing is that um before before Nichols and May ever met each other, uh, a mutual friend said uh to to Elaine, I want you to meet Mike. You're both 
you're both mean and you're both method. So yeah. they knew about the method in Chicago already, definitely. Um, but but I, I think their genius as performers, Nichols and May's genius, was that they were able to draw on the best of both worlds. I mean, they didn't they didn't scoff at the method at all. They took they took that teaching really seriously. And and um, Strasberg was very important to Mike, although he later said that that he thought those acting classes that he took were more prepared him more for directing than they prepared him for acting. Um, so they were able to combine that with some of the stuff that they had developed in Chicago. You asked about, you know, how they developed their routines. And so much of it was, uh, um, you know, they developed them kind of by fire. You know, Elaine May told me this extraordinary story of um, the first time that the two of them got on stage together in a Chicago club to do a sketch that they thought they had really worked out. Um, a, a sketch where uh, a, a guy gets um, increasingly frantic um, when he's calling a girl and she isn't there and isn't picking up. A, a girl who he had dumped but now is kind of jealous about and wants to date again. And she said the minute they got on stage, they realized that they had come up with a concept, but absolutely no way to dramatize it. Because how could you dramatize dialing a phone and not having someone there? What is the person who's not there supposed to do in that scene? And for that matter, what is the person who's dialing the phone supposed to do in that scene? So they completely bombed. And you know, from that they learned like the hard way that they really had to work out the beats of a scene and how to move a scene along and how to how to make something dramatic, not just to come up with a situation. And and I think that was um, that was a really important moment uh, in the development of Nichols and May because so much of what they did was kind of very very keyed into how an audience was reacting. They they Mike said he could tell when an audience was silent because it was paying attention and in suspense versus when it was silent because it was bored or or a, a beat of a scene had gone on too long. Um, you know, that he could he could tell when changing one word in a line would would make a big difference in terms of the the humor or the emotion of a scene. And um, you know, that's really like that kind of incredible fine tuning night after night after night was how they developed a lot of their most famous routines. But even after they got really successful, they also just made up a whole bunch of stuff on the spur of the moment. And if it worked, it worked. And if it didn't, it didn't. Uh, thank you for that. I mean, one of the things that I'm curious about, because it does seem like they created their own language, their own rhythm, really just by working with each other. I'm wondering who they looked to, not just in terms of the people around them or who they were learning from, who they were working with, but in terms of popular culture, like who made Mike Nichols laugh? Who made Elaine May laugh before they were doing this work? That's so interesting. I, you know, I don't think that they had a lot of role models because they were so, you know, um, I mean, there's that famous line that, that like comedians are people who, if you say something funny, will look at you and say, that's really funny, but they'll never laugh. Like Mike was a big laugher. I don't think Elaine was a big laugher. Um, and they like what they were doing was so different um, than what, for instance, Sid Caesar and Imogene Coco were doing on, you know, uh, your show of shows or something like that. Like first of all, the the idea of a male female comedy team was was kind of unusual. I mean, it was. You know, it was very unusual for a woman to be doing comedy at that point, period. But also, um, they weren't doing stand-up. You know, they, they didn't come out and tell jokes uh, and, and face front and wait for the laugh. They were doing character comedy and sketches. And um, a lot of what they did, I mean, not by any means all of it, but a lot of it had this kind of sexual charge between them. I mean, and that... and. I guess this is why I'm I'm dodging a little your your role models question because I I I have such a hard time thinking of who might have done that that they they ever could have looked to 
before them. I mean, you could certainly see sexual chemistry between actors and actresses on screen, but to have comic sexual chemistry was really unusual. And and also, um, Elaine was sexy. I mean, she yeah. she she said, you know, that that in the Compass Players, she always got. Um, the part of like the femme fatale because she she was she was the one who you know you could throw a beret and a trench coat on her and and she'd you know she'd suddenly look glamorous and that was really i mean it, it, i think one of the reasons they took off so hard and so fast was that they there was really nobody like them who like the stuff that they did together was really sexy especially on their records the first record you know improvisations to music is so um carnal in many ways but at the same time it's incredibly funny and they they um they make fun of things that that just were so specific that no one had really made fun of before like hitting on a woman and failing at it and then what's the thing that you say to cover your own embarrassment and 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 kind of save face you know they're the, the kind of comedy that Mike loved most, and I think Elaine, too, was the kind of comedy they said that, that would make someone in the audience listen to it and suddenly say, oh, I, I know that guy. I am that guy. I never realized that anybody but me did that, and I definitely never realized that anybody but me noticed it. Um, that was what they really loved doing. Well, Elaine May obviously... Uh considered very beautiful by most people around her and most people who witnessed her, um, had a very sensual voice that comes across really well on rec on recordings. And um, I also am I'm struck by the dryness in her tone at the same time as the sensuality. And I was wondering if you could just speak to what even female stand-ups, like how they presented themselves um, and how they spoke. You know, I think the 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 pool of female standups who were doing, I mean, I almost can't think of any, you know, like I, in the 1960s, I think of like Joan Rivers and Phyllis Diller and Tody Fields, um, all of whom had to, um, and you know, Moms Mabley, like it was almost like to be a, a, a woman standup in those early days, you had to, like the the toll you had to pay was basically getting up on stage and saying some version of I'm ugly or I'm so unattractive that blah 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 like just to make yourself relentlessly the butt of the joke and um and that's you know a good 10 years after Nichols and May that was not Elaine May's vibe at all and and she wouldn't have been able to do it um but also, you know, those those records are so interesting because they they really I mean, you're you're right to point out her the quality of her voice because you know, you have to uh absolutely imagine her as a whole bunch of different characters when you listen to those records. And and the fact that she could be anything from like an innocent teenage girl to this like sed devastatingly seductive, sophisticated to this nagging mother. I mean, I, I really, I don't think that either of them, but especially Elaine, get enough credit for what impeccable vocal performers they were. Well, you, you brought up the first album, which is Improvisations to Music. And I'd, I'd like to ask you about Mike Nichols and music. Um, because, of course, he was like a music programmer. And I think there's something that goes throughout all of his films that has this like very musical, music-heavy component to it. Would you mind talking about Mike Nichols and music? Yeah, I think, I think he, um, I think it was part of his upbringing. Um, you know, his, his, his father, the doctor, had uh, both in Berlin and then in New York a pretty... Um, show busy clientele uh mu musicians were his patients and music producers were his patients and and i'm sure that and, and you know uh he, when mike was just a teenager his his mother took him to um 
hear Leonard Bernstein conduct, um, and uh, who was very very young at the time. So so it, it seems really clear to me that that music and music appreciation was was a big part of Nichols's upbringing, and that that you were, you know, that was a time when you really were supposed to be. Um, fluent in in musical knowledge it was really kind of culturally important so i think um you know that leads really naturally to uh improvisations to music which is the first of their three records and and you know what that what that record was was basically a series of tracks about 10 tracks where there's music playing in the background and what's in the foreground is some kind of dialogue between uh, him and her. And, you know, the, the, the sort of formal challenge of that is really pretty remarkable. Like there's no, each track is sort of between two and I guess eight minutes and there's no time to explain anything. Like you have to paint just entirely in words and by the background music that was chosen who these characters are, what their objectives are, what the tension is between them, and what what is the situation that needs to be uh, resolved. And you have to do it with with no visuals too. So um, there's there's one you know uh, I think one of the the tracks on it is essentially this kind of uh, almost sex act that, that the two of them share while listening to music. Um, so the music in, in that becomes a kind of explicit part of the text. Um, and and uh, it's, the album is still funny. I mean, it's really great. And it also, it, it, it did a really important thing, which is that as Nichols and May were rising, um, that, that first album helped nationalize their popularity in a way. And it was also, you know, it's, it's so easy for us to remember in the, in the sort of YouTube and streaming era that um, that first record was the first time that people had the opportunity to listen to Nichols and May routines over and over again. And there's a whole generation of Nichols and May fans that essentially memorized that album. And if you knew it word for word and could kind of show someone else that you knew it word for word, you knew that you had found a kindred spirit. I want to go back to Chicago uh, before we leave Chicago to go to New York. <laughs> and um, my question is, you know, why'd they leave? Why'd they leave Compass in particular? What was going on at the time? Well, Compass is a really um, complicated thing. I mean, a whole a whole book has been written about the, the sort of rise and fall and rise and recreation and turmoil of Compass. But, you know, I think the, the way to shorthand it is, even today, if you get together any creative enterprise that is founded by, you know, about 15 different people all in their early or mid 20s, you're going to get this really interesting and volatile combination of people who are just in it for a lark, but are eventually going to move on and do something else with their lives, people who are in it and want to go all the way with it and are completely committed to this. And so there was never a point when Compass was not in some sort of state of turmoil, breaking up and reforming in a new city. And, and finally, it really did break up. And uh, they, they tried to sort of, uh, they left Chicago and tried to rebuild it from scratch with Nichols and May as the kind of main attraction in um, Missouri and St. Louis. And, you know, they, they went to New York, I think, because at that time, if you wanted to hit it big, you went to New York. I mean, you could say, why not Los Angeles? But in 1957, when Nichols and May arrived in New York, I think we have to remember that, you know, not only was it the center of Broadway and off-Broadway theater, it was the center of publishing, um, and it was a huge center of television. Um, and, you know, every Hollywood studio had talent scouts watching TV shows, looking at the uh, acting classes, um, looking at who was on Broadway or off Broadway, uh, reading everything that came out of the publishing houses. I mean, ho Hollywood used New York as its main um, sort of spigot of material. So Nichols and May went 
where the action was basically. They knew that if they wanted to make it on a larger scale, they they had to be in New York. Well, did anybody know about them before they got to New York? Did they, you know, cause a stir? Were there was there word of mouth from Chicago? Uh, people knew about them in Chicago. Like they were definitely a Chicago phenomenon and people they got to a point where people would come to see them you know several times in a row including you know the the woman who became mike's first wife pat scott but no they did not yet have uh, a national profile i mean the, when they got to new york the first thing they basically did was audition for uh, a talent agent um who very very quickly got them uh, a booking, but it's it's not as if they were in demand anywhere. I mean, they the we're, and we're talking about like the fall of 1957 when they arrive. Their rise after that is so fast, but they basically start as on a national level unknowns. Well, like let's get into it. So they come to New York, and. You know, what's, where's the first place that they performed? Because there are now, you know, all of these clubs where um, music, folk music is definitely uh, sort of rising in New York at the same time as some sort of different kinds of comedians, you know, Mort Saul and, you know, that kind of stand up is taking off. Uh, what kind of world are they encountering in New York when they arrive? Yeah, this was so much fun for me to research because it's really the story of a vanished New York, um, you know, which is what you're talking about, a New York of like rising folk music, beatnik culture, like the the the, the earliest forms of um, spoken word or, or, you know, poetry, like slam nights before that was even a word. Um, and still at the same time, old fashioned thriving, uh, nightclub culture, which had been around for, you know, 30, 35, 40 years. Um, so, so their first, the, their first and second booking come in rapid succession. The, the, they basically get booked into this midtown club called the Blue Angel. Um, this very, very uh, posh, you know, gray fabric on the walls with rosettes, you know, white tablecloth kind of place. Um, but they have no money. Nichols and May. They come to New York basically broke, and so they say to uh, uh, their manager, that, that's really great, but we need something now, not in two weeks. And so the same guy who uh, owned the Blue Angel, Max Gordon, also owned the Village Vanguard, which was a much kind of uh, less glamorous, uh, younger, more hip kind of black turtleneck uh, club in the West Village that still exists. Um, with, you know, scrapey chairs and wood floors and jazz combos. And, and, and so that's their first New York booking at the Village Vanguard for two weeks, opening for Mort Saul. Wow. I mean, and, and, you know, you're talking about, you know, scouts looking out for people all the time. Where, where do you think they really sort of took off as stars on the small, small stages? I don't think it was the Village Vanguard because that was such a short booking, although it's notable that, that they did so well so quickly that Mort Saul started canceling them and, <laughs> and say, you know, they, they only had like 15 minutes to, to do a show before they were the warm up act. Yeah. Um, uh, Mort Saul started saying, you know, no, 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 I think the audience is, is, good enough tonight. We don't need you. Um, they started getting noticed when they moved to the Blue Angel um, and uh, uh, instantly started. And again, they were an opening act. I think they were opening for Tom Lehrer. And I think a number of other people were on that bill, but they instantly started getting noticed. And, you know, it was a really like late night culture too. Um, uh, you know, so, some of their shows were at midnight. Like there was a very happening New York uh, late night club culture back then. And that's when reviews start appearing. There's a piece in the New York Daily News. There's a piece in the New Yorker. Um, and suddenly they're like this hot discovery. The piece in the New Yorker in particular basically framed them as the, the writer starts out by essentially saying, I'm outside the Blue Angel. There's a huge crowd. What's it all about? It's about these two young people. And 
very soon after that, they start getting um, interest from late night TV shows, uh, mm -hmm. like want to give them a spot. And, you know, within, within a couple of months of their first New York appearance, they do uh, a, a TV appearance on a series called Omnibus, where they're able to do two sketches. And they are, it sounds like this is made up, but it really is not. They are instantly nationally famous. So do the recordings come right after that or is it more television? It's a lot more television at first. Like 1958 is um, basically a time of suddenly like the, the clubs want them forever. Their, their price has skyrocketed. They make more for one TV appearance than they did in their last year in Chicago. Um, they're, they're flying back and forth between Los Angeles and New York to do various variety shows and talk shows. Um, they don't have a huge repertoire of sketches. They have about a half dozen and start doing some of them more than once because people want to see them more than once um, on these shows. And then um, I think that uh, 1959, which is uh, the year of the town hall appearance, um, is also the year of their first um, comedy album, uh, Improvs to Music. Well, I just wanted to pull up, you know, just, you know, this, it, could you speak about Laugh Line in particular? <laughs> right. <laughs> Laugh Line was, was like the, the rare Nichols and May failure. I mean, they did have this period in 1957 and eight and part of 1959 where, you know, they, they were trying things out. Like what could they do? Were they just about doing their own sketches or could they, could they act? Could they play roles in like live 90 minute TV dramas uh, or live 90 minute TV musicals? Could they be on a game show panel like Laugh Line? And, and they, they discovered pretty quickly what worked and what didn't for them. And they were pretty ruthless about throwing out what didn't work. So Laugh Line, which was this really, like wildly over elaborate kind of doomed to failure concepty game show where essentially four panelists had to spend a great deal of time arranging a bunch of actors in a tableau. And once they were all in position, they would compete to see who could write the best caption for it. It just was never going to work. And, and, uh, and they quit almost instantly. I, I mean, quit and, and Mike sort of trashed it in the, in the press. I mean, it wasn't the best way to handle it, but, but they were very, very young and just really flying by the seat of their pants and, and figuring out what worked for them and what didn't. So by the time they come to the town hall, they're a huge club hit. They're famous around the country. They've got an album in already. Uh, why a show at a 1500 seater? Well, it, a 1500 seater of course was, a huge step up for them. I mean, like this, the the, the leap in uh, going from an intimate nightclub to something like town hall was was really a test. Um, it it was a way to say, you know, not that they were explicitly thinking of Broadway yet, but it was only uh, seventeen months between their town hall appearance and their Broadway debut with um, an evening with Mike Nichols and Elaine May, and I think. Um, the town hall appearance was uh, their first chance to kind of answer the question that a lot of people had about Nichols and May, which was, there was always a vibe of like, well, I think they're really funny, but they're never going to be mainstream. People, people like real Americans won't get them. Um, v Variety, when they did uh, reviewed Nichols and Ray for the first time, called them uh, hipsters, hipsters, and they they did not mean it complimentarily. They they basically said, you know, th this is for sophisticated spots, and in average places, the material is not going to work at all. So, New York City, the town hall audience is obviously not some sort of generic American cross section. But it is a big crowd, and it really is a chance to see. They did two shows, and it really was a chance to see, like, do they shrink and become kind of small and inconsequential in, in a 1,500-seat space, or do they kind of feel like they expand to fill it? And I think the verdict was they expanded to fill it. 
Well, I mean, what were they, do you have any sense of what the content was that night? I know there in some reviews, um, some snippets, but what were they talking about at this point or what were some of the skits or sketches that they were working with, you know, around May, 1959? You know, by that point they had, um, they had a set group of pieces that they were really pretty comfortable with. There was one called Teenagers um, that they had done on TV, which was um, uh, a boy and a girl in the front seat of a car, and he wants to go farther than she does, and it's about her vulnerability and his awkwardness and bravado. Uh, I imagine that was one. There was one they did called Mother and Son, uh, which was uh, about... Um, uh, a, a rocket scientist in the middle of a launch whose who's Jewish mother calls to guilt trip him for, for not calling more. Um, uh, the, a, a lot of the sketches they did, you know, Mike really liked playing impatience. So a lot of the sketches they did were kind of structured around her frustrating him in some way. There's a famous one that I'm sure they did uh, uh, where he's down to his last dime and he's trying to get a series of operators, all of whom are played by Elaine, to place a call. And the the striking thing is that they also did a sketch called Pirandello, which was mm -hmm. considered their most formally complicated and difficult sketch. And it was basically, it's a sketch that is deliberately designed to continually pull the rug out from under the audience it's it's this kind of trick sketch and it's the only one they never recorded so i'm i'm only going by mm -hmm. their accounts of it but um it's it's the sketch where they start by playing children um and then they sort of seamlessly go into children imitating their parents and having a fight and seamlessly go into the parents actually having a fight and then seamlessly seem to go into the two of them having a fight about the actual sketch and insulting each other that way. And it actually kind of comes to blows. And everyone who saw it said that um, when it worked, it made you profoundly uncomfortable, that they were able to completely convince you each time that something had gone wrong in the sketch and that you were seeing the kind of breakup of a partnership um, uh, in progress. And I know that they did that one on um on the town hall nights so i i think probably the lineup was very similar to what their broadway show ended up being where when all of those sketches were included well this is obviously like a big thing for them and i'm wondering was it common for improv generally to be done at concert halls at that time no not at all i mean when, and when you read the uh handful of reviews of it from the time there, there there seems to be a kind of level of surprise that uh that Nichols and May are there in the first place I mean uh you know Town Hall was so associated with um music performances and and a certain kind of like established acts played Town Hall and and Nichols and May being there was was a kind of it it was it was taken sort of implicitly as a statement that like oh these people are important like we have to some they're a town hall we have to take them seriously you know mm -hmm. uh, it, it was like town hall conferred something on them but in a way they also conferred something on town hall it was it was like a way of saying town town hall can you know is a hip venue that can accommodate uh, very, very hot, young, new talent like this. Well, it's interesting that it takes place in 1959 because it's one of my favorite years in town hall history where like just a lot of cool things <laughs> happen. What else happened? I want to know. Um, I think that's the year that Sammy Davis Jr. Uh, records his first live album, which is like the year before the Rat Pack really gets together. Um, Nina's, so this is one of my favorite day, weeks in town hall history. In the same week in September 1959, Jacques Cousteau comes to the town hall to show two of his like con, you know, award winning films um, at a fundraiser for an oceanographer who died off of Long Island. That same week, Nina Simone makes her town hall debut. 
I mean, actually her concert hall debut, which ends wow. up being the first live album. So 19, that's just one week in 1959. Uh, so yeah, it's one of my favorite years in town hall history, just because Thelonious Monk, everybody was in and out there. So it kind of is the hippest year. I've got to look back and see who was doing the bookings then. Um, but yeah, so I'm curious, you know, there's, there's a year and a half before the Broadway dates. What are they doing in between? And is doing Broadway or doing um, a show on that scale always in the back of their mind? And what are they doing when they go elsewhere? Like, are they touring? I, I don't think it was always in the back of uh, their minds, but I think there was definitely an understanding back then that, that if you were a successful stage act, um, if at all possible, Broadway was the finish line. I mean, that, that was the apex. That was where you really wanted to get. So, so, um, and I think after Town Hall, that becomes a reality. I think I think to the extent that Town Hall was a test, um, they passed it. And the second test for them was they brought their act to San Francisco and played another large venue there. And and th it was really important, I think, to see if a non New York audience would would get their humor, um, because there even in the TV they had done, there was already uh, emerging. Uh, a slight difference in the way Los Angeles audiences reacted to some of their references and the way New York audiences did. Um, and then, you know, as was the tradition um, uh, back then, uh, the, uh, Nichols and May went out of town once they decided that uh, they were going to open on Broadway, which they did in October of 1960. There were three bookings. Um, not just three nights, but three runs um, in successively larger venues and and closer venues to New York City um, that preceded that, uh, just to kind of get the show on its feet and figure out what worked and what didn't. And um, some of the show did change along uh, along the way uh, and got refined. And also, um, they brought in Arthur Penn as director. They had gotten to know him a little bit, and um, the producer of the Nichols and May show, Alexander Cohen thought they could use a director. And Penn didn't, um, he didn't like recalibrate their performances at all. He just really helped them understand like what the rhythm of a night might feel like and where the act break should come and what the, what the table and chairs on the stage should look <laughs> like and how to pace the show and things like that. Um, I, you know, thinking about that period uh, it seems short in in you know in retrospect, a year and a half or so. But for performers who are performing several times, you know, a week, it actually is a long time. And I'm wondering how much television did they end up doing? And Therese McNally has a question: Did they appear on that was the week that was? Um, okay, first part of the question first. They, I think they probably did about like. 15 appearances between the time they first made their television, uh, ma they made their first television appearance on like the Jack Parr show or the Steve Allen show and uh, the time they went to Broadway, maybe 20. Um, you know, they would, they would show up occasionally. Uh, they did do, um, that was the week that was, but uh, I think that was not until later um they 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 i think their their famous funeral home sketch uh was um debuted on that was the week that was and and you know mainly the tv they did before that was a combination of ongoing shows like the dinah shore show the tonight show um the steve allen show and um primetime variety specials, which were a very common thing in the 50s and 60s. Well, you know, we get to 1960 and they're on Broadway. How does that go? Oh, it's a huge hit. I mean, I, I say, I, I've said to people that it was sort of the Hamilton of its, of its moment, um, which sounds a little glib, but it really was in terms of, you know, the show ran from October of 1960 to, I, I think, May or June of 1961 when it stopped because Elaine really didn't want to do it anymore. Um, but it it was that, 
it was like that show, that show that you had to see. If you were a celebrity coming in from London or coming in from Los Angeles, you had to go see Mike and Elaine and you had to go backstage afterwards and, and uh, congratulate them. And, and it, it, the show was a little different every night because it famously always ended with a completely improvised sketch where they would ask someone in the audience to provide them a, a first line, a last line, and a literary style. And they would make up and perform a sketch on the spot based on that. And, and you know, a lot of people assumed that there were audience plants and it was the same, you know, six or eight sketches that they alternated. But but I, I looked at the stage manager's sort of logbook of the play and they actually did sketches based on 90 different literary styles, which is just incredible. And and it was almost never the same the same opening line or closing line twice. Wow. I mean that sounds incredible. And there's no recording of it. I I mean there's the recording actually there's the actual LP. Yeah, there's 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 an LP which is um, pieces of it. Mm -hmm. What's unfortunate is there's no recording of Pirandello, which was a big um, part of the show, and there's no recording of any of the um, the final uh, improv on the spot sketches, which would just be such an amazing thing to have. Well, a year later, and they're done as a duo, what, right. what led to that? Um, you know, the show closes in the summer of 61 and, and the, they, Elaine in particular really feels she needs a break and Mike wants to give her space. And the plan is for Elaine to write a play that she's already begun working on that Mike will star in. And uh, that, that play is eventually supposed to go to Broadway in the fall of 1962. And they start out of town tryouts in Philadelphia. And it just becomes completely clear that they are in the wrong roles, that Mike is acutely uncomfortable on stage being directed. Uh, I mean, Elaine isn't technically directing it, but she's definitely calling the shots. Um, he thinks the play is too long and wants her to cut it. He doesn't think, she doesn't think uh, he's delivering the kind of performance that the character needs. It gets really ugly and tough between them. The play opens in Philadelphia, it bombs, it closes out of town and um, never comes to Broadway. And th that's the only real rift in their career. I mean, they're, it's very clear to them both that their, their partnership, their performing partnership is over. Um, and they, they're going to go their separate ways. And for a year and a half or two years, they really, they, they still do a couple of like special performances together of, of sketches for charities and things like that. But they're basically not speaking to each other unless they're on stage performing. And then really very soon after that, things start to thaw. And, and what emerges out of that thaw is just um, a lifelong friendship and connection and and they eventually do work together again many many times but in different ways they act together on stage in a revival of who's afraid of virginia wolf in 1980 and um elaine writes three of mike's movies and she shows him all of the scripts that uh she ends up directing and he shows her all of his and you know they, their friendship lasts uh, for the rest of Mike's life. But but those the breakup years were tough. Well, Ken Schutzman has a question. He asks, how did Mike Nichols make the leap from performing to directing? And perhaps why? Um, in 1963, after the breakup and, and during the really dark part of the breakup, Mike really did not know what he wanted to do next. He was acting on stage at a Canadian theater festival, but it wasn't clear. Even um, Leonard Bernstein said to him, you know, oh, Mike, you're so good. We just don't know at what. Um, it, it, he, he really thought, you know, Elaine was the talented half of, of our partnership. And now what am I going to do? And um, he's given this play by Neil Simon, who's not any kind of big success yet, called Nobody Loves Me, and uh, given the opportunity to direct it uh, out of town, uh, just for summer stock. Um, 
and then maybe it will go to Broadway if it works, and maybe it doesn't. And he he kind of auditions as director, and they agree to let him have a try. The play stars Robert Redford and Elizabeth Ashley, and uh, Mike said that from the first day he walked into the rehearsal room, he thought, oh, this is this is my job. This is what I'm meant to do. That This is what I should be doing for the rest of my uh, career. You know, he's, he's only uh, 31 years old when, when he has this realization and, and already has a full extraordinary career behind him. So what incredible luck that he would, you know, that he would happen on this thing that he really says he knew from the first minute was right for him and he never looked back. Well, Teresa has another question. What was distinctive about Nichols' direction and what made him such a master? And I would add to that, what do you think comes out of the Chicago years and the Nichols and May years that carry him through his directing career? Well, I think you, you've you just started to give the answer to that question, which is the, the distinctive thing about Mike's direction came out in a large part of, of the fact that he had a performing background um, because, you know, f first of all, Mike really loved working with women uh, and, and really respected them and treated them as colleagues and as equals, which a lot of male directors of his generation did not. Um, and I think that's largely because his formative creative relationship throughout his 20s was with a woman, which is very unusual for, for a man of his generation. But also, what emerged for me as so fascinating, you know, what, what Mike was famous for as a director was this almost psychic ability to understand what actors needed um, uh, in terms of analogies or stories or guidance uh, or, or tricks or techniques to help them find their performance. Um, but Mike also had an extraordinary sense of how an audience was reacting and how... Um, how when something was playing too slowly or too quickly. Uh, and all of that, I think, was developed in his performing years with Elaine May, because what he often said was that um, Elaine could invent endlessly, that if you gave her a character, she could instantly come up with 10, 12, 15 things for that character to say, and could just go on within that character indefinitely. And Mike, by his own admission, could not do that. That wasn't his strength. So he developed a complementary strength, which was a deep, deep instinct for how to move from one beat of a scene to the next, when to move the plot along, when to kind of come in and take what Elaine was doing and give it shape in terms of like, all right, she's established this character, now let's create a tense situation that has to be resolved. That kind of, as an actor, he started thinking like a director, but as a director who was, of course, intensely sympathetic to actors and what they need. So I think that, that, that very distinctive thing, um, along with these really acute observational gifts about um, class and pretension and social awkwardness, you know, all the things that he had discovered really worked as an actor, as a performer, were also things uh, he realized that he should be bringing out as a director. Well, he starts out in the theater um, with Neil Simon and so many other playwrights of uh, that time period who are very were, I mean, it's theater, so it's very text-based um, work. There's lots of words, for example. It's a very different medium from cinema. What was that transition like for him? What did he take and what did he have to adapt when now he's doing a largely image-based form? Um, I think that uh, initially, in the first set of movies he made, starting with Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf, you know, Mike at first was worried that he didn't sufficiently understand film technique. Uh, and, and, you know, it's it's interesting that he starts out, you know, with an incredibly wordy, text-dense piece of uh, writing, Who's Afraid of Virginia Woolf? Um, so, so he's doing both from the very beginning. You know, language is incredibly important to him, and yet he's learning all of the techniques of movie making, cinematography, shot selection, editing, lighting, um, 
you know, lenses, stuff like that, that he really didn't know. He gets a crash course in in his first few movies. And then uh, in the 80s, when after a fairly long period of not directing movies, he comes back, um, he is suddenly less interested in technique and more interested in in the things that um, that drove him in theater as well. The chance to work with a piece of text that he really loved or with actors who he really loved or with both. Um, and, and his feeling that whether he was in, uh, whether he was directing movies or um, theater, you know, he, he said the two jobs of a director are to answer the question, what is this really like? Like what this situation, whatever we're depicting on stage, what is it actually, what would it be like um, when it happens in, in a movie or in a play, even if it's the most far-fetched thing, you have to kind of make it real and to answer the question, what happens next? Um, so in other words, to keep it going, to keep it moving, to make sure that there is always a question that, that the audience is hanging on. So, so those two things, the, the first one, you know, keeping it real and the second one, keeping it moving were, were really his hallmarks as a director. You know, it's so interesting what you say about him working, his working relationship with Elaine May as setting the precedent for all of these great working relationships with other uh, women in, in entertainment. And I'm thinking of the 80s, of course, the two films he did with Meryl Streep, but also um, the, you know, taping with Gilna Radner or, you know, what he basically did for Whoopi and, you know, her stand-up career. Could you speak a bit to that? I know you've already said that, you know, what you've said, but. <laughs> the, I mean, the, the, the list is so long of like, not just women who worked with him, but women who worked with him more than once, which I think is a really telling thing. It's it's Meryl Streep, it's it's Whoopi Goldberg, it's Emma Thompson, um, it's uh, Natalie Portman, um, it's uh, Julia Roberts. Uh, I, I mean, Mike really understood actresses and really understood women and really liked them it seems like a strange thing to say but there are there are directors out there including some very good directors who get good results who don't particularly like actors who, f who feel that actors are sort of a necessary evil to to be tolerated on the way to realizing your vision mike was not like that he glenn close is another one who we worked with twice um uh you know, he, Mike loved them, and 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 they really loved Mike. You know, toward toward the end of his life, um, four of the women he had worked with in the mid nineteen eighties: um, uh, Cynthia Nixon, Christine Baranski, uh, both of whom he also worked with more than once: Glenn Close and Whoopi Goldberg. Um, like, really, only a couple of months before he died, they they took him out. Um, for a meal just to kind of reminisce and to to tell him how much uh his work with them had meant to them that's that's really a pretty extraordinary um gift to be given i think at the end of your life and 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 really speaks to um how powerful those those uh connections that, that mike made with actresses were well that gets to an important question um how much time did you spend with Mike Nichols while writing this book and, you know, while researching all this, what kind of level of access did you have to be able to, you know, write a 600? Yeah, it's a long one. Um, Mike had died before I uh, started the book. I, I had not ever thought of doing a biography until he passed away, which was in, um, December of 2014, and I started to work on the book in early 2015. Um, so while I got to talk to many, many of the people that we're talking about, you know, first and foremost, probably being Elaine May, um, the time I spent with Mike was before I ever thought of doing a book, and that was from around um, 2000 or 2001, which is when uh, Mike started working on uh, Angels in America for HBO, which my husband wrote. That's how I first got to know Mike. And then 
in around 2004, I started interviewing Mike extensively for my first book, which was largely about the making of The Graduate. So I kind of got to know him two ways, in, in, in like a family way and a professional way, and was really privileged to know him for um, the last, I guess, 12 or 13 years of his life. And it's, it's not as if I was lucky enough or smart enough to amass um, all of the material in this book in those years. You know, every day I worked on the book, uh, there was some question that I wish I could have asked him. But I did, of course, get to know um, Mike's way of speaking and his way of thinking and his, his, his way of talking about the work he did and, and talking about directing and talking about acting. Um, and uh, I, I felt that I got to know what mattered to him. And also Mike was a really good, he was a really good storyteller, but he was also a really good interview subject. He, when you asked him a question, he would really think about the answer and, and, and not just go into a sort of, uh, sort of pre-taped, response, which, you know, would be the most understandable thing in the world, because how many millions of times must he have been asked about the graduate? Um, but, but if you asked Mike a question from a slightly new angle, he was very willing to think about it from a slightly new angle. So, so that's how I got to know him. And, and certainly the, the time I spent with him uh, gave me a kind of uh, confidence in in writing about him that I don't know that I uh, would have had otherwise. Even though when I started work on it, I very quickly discovered that the pile of what I didn't know was much much higher than the pile of what I did know. Um, as as a person who loves to be in archives, what kind of access did you have to notes or ephemera or anything else that he kept? And did he even keep stuff? Because not all artists <laughs> He did not keep a lot that I know of. I mean, Mike actually used to joke that, I mean, you know, his papers, what there are of them have been preserved, but are not available yet to scholars. Um, uh, Mike used to joke that he had made uh, his, his the life of any future biographer impossible, um, which he didn't, but he didn't make it any easier. Um, so I relied a lot. I mean, fortunately, there are there were a ton of people to interview. I talked to about 250 people. And also, there are just great, great archives at places like um, the Performing Arts Library, uh, which was especially helpful in reconstructing um, Mike's theater career. Lots of personal letters and papers and memos. Um, and fortunately, a lot of the people I talked to, Mike may not have saved all his stuff, but they saved all of Mike's stuff. So I got to, to um, reconstruct the story from that angle a little bit. And how was it speaking with Elaine May while making this book? Well, just thrilling. I mean, just thrilling because she has not given a lot of interviews over the years. And um, I had never really talked to her extensively before we had met socially a couple of times. But um, it, she's so smart and she's so insightful and she's she's so blunt and and uh, so incredibly funny, of course. Uh, but I think what surprised me maybe was how emotional she was. How that that in talking about those early years, that bad performance uh, that she and and uh, Mike gave that I talked to you about, for instance, it was as if it had happened yesterday. I mean, she. The, the the emotions of it, the the sense of what she was feeling, the embarrassment, I could hear it in her voice. I mean, it was so vivid. So it was um, thrilling to talk to her and to try to really um, do her part of the story uh, justice. Because you know, of course, Elaine May deserves her own biography and will have one. Um, but but she's. She's such an essential part. I think she's mentioned at least in all but two or three chapters of this, you know, 35 chapter uh, book I wrote. She's that important. Um, so it was just so exciting to talk to her. I loved it. Well, we do have a, a couple of good questions from the audience. We are gonna ask a question about The Graduate. <laughs> 
Um, Mark asked, was it a hard sell for Mike Nichols to arrange for Simon, Simon and Garfunkel to compose the signature songs for the soundtrack, or did some of those songs exist already? Uh, almost all of those songs existed already. Uh, it was it was a harder sell for um, Mike to convince uh, Joseph Levine, the financier of the movie, that that people wouldn't be disappointed if you used pre-existing music uh, than it was to convince Simon and Garfunkel. And of course, the funny thing is that that probably the the most associated song with the graduate is Mrs. Robinson. And people always say, you know, how, it's such an injustice that um, Mrs. Robinson wasn't nominated for the best song Oscar. Uh, it wasn't nominated because it didn't exist. Like the, the few fragments of Mrs. Robinson that you hear in the movie um, are the only parts of the song that existed when the movie was completed. I mean, Simon and Garfunkel eventually finished the song and wrote it and it became a huge hit off of The Graduate, but but it it wasn't ready. It was just a piece of music. It was originally called Mrs. Roosevelt that um, that Mike liked and and thought was uh, was right for the movie. So um, that's that's the story of Simon and Garfunkel and The Graduate. That's really funny. Well, we have a question about legacy, and I have a follow up to that. Uh, Kathy asks, did any stand up comment comics? later credit Mike and Elaine as major influences? You know, it, it, there, there are people like, um, it, it's such an interesting array of people who have credited Mike and Elaine as influences. I mean, you, you know, I talked to the brilliant short story writer, Deborah Eisenberg, who said that um, listening to Mike as a DJ um, in Chicago when he hosted the Midnight Special was was really profoundly important to her. Um, and Steve Martin, who later worked with um, Mike Nichols, said that for him the albums uh, really meant a lot. That getting to listen to those routines over and over again um, really uh, meant a great deal to him. Um, so. In some ways, it's not because they weren't stand-ups. Their influence isn't directly on stand-ups, but 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 on performers who who kind of understood and and delighted in the the fun and naughtiness and sophistication of what they were doing. I think their their um, their impact was profound. That that um, you know you could be as intelligent as they were and still a mass success. I think. Uh, was was really uh, very meaningful to a lot of people. Well, this is a, a comment, um, not a question, but it's it's one of those comment, not a questions that I actually invite because I like. <laughs> <laughs> this is from Howard. Uh, he says, not a question as such, unless you have a comment on it, but May's presentation of Nichols AFI Lifetime Achievement Award is one of the funniest and most heartfelt award presentations ever. Uh, I, I cannot urge everyone who's watching strongly enough to go on YouTube and find this clip. It's there. Um, it's about eight minutes long. It's, 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 it's in the sort of awards show hall of fame. It's that great. And, and if you have any doubt that Elaine May is a genius, which of course you shouldn't, this will put it to rest. I mean, it's, it's, it's gold. It's just a fantastic uh, virtuoso performance. And I think you touched on this uh, a little before, or you touched, you told us about it, but was Mike supportive of Elaine during her various travails in Hollywood studios? Um, yeah, you know, I think the story on that has yet to be fully written and, and mm -hmm. supported. I mean, you know, Elaine May had a really, really good time on, on uh, one of her movies, I think. Like, well... Uh, the Heartbreak Kid, one of the four movies she directed, but you know, a notoriously hard time on Ishtar and on um, uh, Mikey and Nikki, uh, and and you know, I think I don't think she. And again, like maybe a book down the road will prove this wrong. I don't think she asked Mike for help during those times. I think I think she was very much. Um, on her own, but I'm sure Mike was uh, deeply supportive as a friend. Well, a new leaf, I feel like, is getting a whole renaissance. Or you know, it was on the Criterion Channel. I think it's on. It might be on Amazon now. It's on Prime. But 
that first outing uh, seems to have gained a lot of steam in the last year. Oh, yeah. And it's, I mean, I urge everyone to seek out, you know, I think all of her movies are absolutely worth watching. There's parts of Ishtar that I think are screamingly funny. And, and you know, Elaine May, I mean, she's, she's the, the, her years with Mike on stage were the first act of a pioneering career. What she did was extraordinary, you know, all the way up through um, winning a Tony in her her mid eighties uh, for best actress for the Waverly Gallery. I mean, it's an astonishing career. Uh, before I ask you what's next, uh, Michelle uh, here in the chat says, please write Elaine's biography. <laughs> Uh, the, you know, there there is um, there is a biography of uh, Elaine May by a young woman uh, that is in progress now. She she tweets about it, um, so I will be as excited to um, uh, read that as anyone out there. And I'm really glad that someone's doing it, but it won't be me. <laughs> <laughs> well, what? What else can we expect? Like, what are you working on? And if not actually doing writing, what are you thinking about culturally right now? Um, what I'm thinking about culturally is I think what so many people are uh, thinking about culturally, which is what is coming? What is this going to be? Like, I'm, I'm in New York City, so of course I'm thinking, what, what is post-pandemic theater um, in a... In a culturally awakened time um, when a lot of the inequities of theater have been widely discussed for the one year plus the theater has been kind of idle. What is that theater going to look like? Um, are people ever going to really go back to the movies? And, and if they don't, how is that going to change movies? How, how is the um, economic dominance of streaming services changing everything? So I, I'm, I'm thinking about um, those questions and writing occasionally for uh, New York Magazine and for uh, the New York Times Style Magazine. Um, uh, and as for what I'm doing next, I wish I could tell you. I can't quite yet, but I, I, I know what my next book is going to be. I'm incredibly excited about it. I can't wait to get started, and uh, I'll be able to share that really soon. It's not a biography, I will say that. Okay. Well, I guess we'll just, we'll wait to find out. <laughs> and then one question that is a personal one. Do you have any streaming recommendations, shows, movies? <laughs> streaming recommendations? Oh my gosh. Um, uh, Hacks, the Gene Smart show. If you haven't caught Hacks on HBO Max, I like, I really love Hacks. I really love Pen15 on Hulu. Um, uh I, I just started, you know, I, I watch everything. I'm kind of an all-consuming consumer. So, like, I just started watching The Mandalorian. Like, I catch up with everything eventually, um, you know. Uh, uh, but but I, I wish I, like, the, the last thing I saw that I really, really loved was um, Hacks. And this show called um, Stiesel on Netflix, uh, this... Um, show about like an ultra orthodox uh community uh s-h-t-i-s-e-l that's a good one to catch up with too all right well thank you so much for joining us today it's been a blast and thank you for writing oh, this book it's it's been a delight thank you for the great questions and thank you everybody for watching and for all of your questions um, I want to thank the team who make this program possible. We've got our producer, Alex, in the back, and Jeff, who's also on our team. We all do this together. So thank you to the entire Town Hall staff and board. To support the Town Hall and programs like these, please visit the townhall.org backslash, backslash donate. Uh, please sign up for our newsletter and uh, sign up to our news, uh, our YouTube channel. So just hit subscribe. Uh, we have a program next Tuesday that I think if you are theater goers, you should go to our website and buy a ticket for. And this is a conversation, James Lapine and Stephen Sondheim, uh, moderated by Christine Baranski with two special guests that we are announcing tomorrow. And it is about James Pine's newest book on Sunday in the Park with George.
So please come uh, next week. We'll see you there. You can buy tickets with a book or without a book. We're doing this in partnership with the with the Strand Bookstore. So if you get a ticket, you have the opportunity to get a book at a highly discounted price um, that will be shipped directly to you from the Strand. And even if you are international, we, we will get that book to you. So please head over to the Town Hall website, thetownhall.org, and uh, come join us next Tuesday. Thank you so much, everybody. Have a great night. Thank you.